NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. first thing I want to say is that investigating uh, data and surveillance related issues in the criminal justice system and in national security is my full-time job. So have you, if you have issues like parallel construction or other digital rights issues that you think could really benefit from a more systemic long-term investigation, call me up um, because this is, this is what I am meant to be doing. Uh, so we're going to talk about parallel construction today, also known uh, in some circles as evidence laundering. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I'm going to start and then we'll turn to, um, I'm going to kind of give an overview of the practice, although many people here may already be familiar with it. Uh, Ashley will talk about a specific case uh, in the national security surveillance context, um, and Brian will also speak about what some of the things that they've been seeing in the, the District of New Mexico. Um, how many people had heard of parallel construction before they signed up for this event? Good job. Good job. Okay, great. How many people have had cases of suspected parallel construction? Okay, right, so happening all the time, everywhere, right? Uh, so for those who don't know, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm using parallel construction to mean, or we're using it to mean, measures that a government body takes with the intent of concealing the true origins of evidence by deliberately creating some alternative explanation for how it got that evidence or information. So to break that down, the government goes and it does thing A, as part of its investigation, but it wasn't, doesn't want to disclose that to you, the defense attorney, or to the court. Maybe it's worried that that'll be ruled unconstitutional um, or violating a federal statute or something. So instead, it goes and does thing B and gets some of the same information or evidence or something it can use or wants to use and then pretends that thing A never happened. So a, a kind of what I like to think of as a, a classic example of parallel construction, the thing's best known because of reporting that uh, Reuters has done on this is a federal agency, such as the DEA, gets a tip from some source, maybe it's a surveillance program, maybe it's a human source, could be anything, uh, and they ring up local law enforcement and they say, find a reason to pull over a car matching this description, develop your own probable cause, without really necessarily even telling them anything more. Local law enforcement goes and does this, gets consent to search the vehicle or search the person. Um, and then as far as the defendant knows, that's how the case started. It was with some minor traffic infraction, or maybe nothing at all. Uh, but the traffic stop and the subsequent search, you don't find out about that DEA tip. You don't find out about whatever was underlying that DEA tip. So for all the things I'm going to talk about, please feel free to see our 88-page report called Dark Side, the Secret Origins of Evidence in U.S. Criminal Cases. Uh, I saw a motion recently in which a prosecutor referred to this as internet sources. Um, you're looking at the author, so you can safely say this is not just an internet source, it's actually based on, in most cases, court records, transcripts, motions, things the government itself has said, um, as well as interviews with uh, former prosecutors and with defense attorneys, um, and it's, it's quite detailed, and for, for most of what I'm saying, much more detail will be in there. As I said, Reuters also has done reporting on this, and there is a gold mine of DEA training documents that a journalist named uh, C.J. Chamarella got and shared with a website called Muckrock. So again, you don't take my word for it. Um, the government can take the government's word for it if they, if they try to say this practice doesn't exist. So some examples of this. I gave the kind of classic traffic stop example, um, but I want to kind of stretch that out into some of the other things that have been talked about today and that I know are also going to be discussed during this session. Um, you could have, hypothetically, a police department using a new facial recognition technology that they don't want to disclose because maybe that raises novel constitutional issues. Maybe they don't want to have to talk about how accurate the system is or whether it's equally accurate for everyone. Um, so they, they identify a suspect using, um, you know, say they identify a suspected drug trafficker using a facial recognition program. Um, they look up information about that person's car, and then they go tell someone else to develop their own probable cause to, um, to pull the person over, and then you're in this kind of so-called consent search scenario. That's a hypothetical example of parallel construction. Um, another alleged example out of New Mexico, so it doesn't always have to be this kind of tip and lead system. It doesn't always have to be a traffic stop. Uh, there's a case out of the Albuquerque bus station in New Mexico where an agent allegedly secretly searched, like felt up luggage on the bus while everyone was off the bus on a layover. And then when everybody reboarded the bus, lo and behold, walked right up to somebody and said, can I get consent to search your bag? 
Um, and so they, the agent had actually been, I think without their awareness, caught on videotape doing some potentially unconscious, unconstitutional searches outside the bus. Defense attorneys really pushed for this. But that's an example where the government maybe doesn't want to disclose some earlier alleged search or investigative method, so they try to get consent, or they try to find some other way of, as they put it, recreating the evidentiary trail. Um, it's not in the slides, but I want to mention something here. It's in our report, and let me know if you want examples. And that's called a be on the lookout order. Um, I think Hani just mentioned this idea of, of a bulletin that goes out to law enforcement. I have seen, and we have in our possession, examples of be on the lookout orders that are bulletins that go out to law enforcement saying, look out for this person, or look out for a car with this license plate, and then develop your own probable cause for a stop and a search. And some of them explicitly say, don't tell the suspect that this notice exists. Um, I've also seen one that says, be on the lookout for Mennonites with farm equipment. Yeah, um, because they may be smuggling drugs in the farm equipment. And like, we can all laugh about that, um, but that's also religious profiling, right? So you have the government saying, so some of the risks I'm going to talk about, you actually have that coming to bear where the government is saying, look for this particular religious group, you know, that's using the thing that some of them tend to use, farm equipment, and somehow that's enough cause, that's a, a good enough reason to develop your own probable cause to stop and search them. So you can see the kinds of really constitutionally problematic practices this could facilitate and hide. So what are some of the problems with this? I'm, I know I'm preaching to the, to the choir here, um, but of course, one big thing parallel construction could do is shield unlawful conduct, or shield conduct that raises novel constitutional questions because they don't want to get an adverse decision out of a court. And it makes fruit of the poisonous tree arguments very difficult. It's hard to argue about the fruit when you can't see the tree. Um, it could also lead to coercion of consent to search. When I was doing this research, in case after case, decision after decision that I looked at, um, you know, officers would, would develop reasonable suspicion for a Terry stop, pull the person over, ask for consent to search the car or search their person. Um, if the person said no, the officers would let them walk away a couple steps and then say, oh, hey, can I ask you some more questions? And I think you can really ask whether if you're a, a local law enforcement officer and you've gotten this call from the DEA or whomever saying find a reason to stop and search this car, are you really going to take no for an answer? Is this really ever going to be consent or are you going to keep pushing until you get this supposed consent? Do you have any intention of ever letting that person go? I think the answer is probably no. There is, there's a risk of perjury by officers at trial and there have been some alleged instances of that. Um, courts don't wind up ruling on new technologies. So again, you can think about the facial recognition example, you can think about you know, very high-tech things or very sweeping things that the NSA could be doing or that other, um, that the FBI could be doing, and courts don't wind up reaching these new technologies in policing. Uh, it creates Brady problems, which I think some of my colleagues might talk about. Again, if you don't know whatever this underlying method is, or potentially this underlying collection of data, you don't know to be asking for any exculpatory information from that source. It creates inequalities in the justice system. If you have a savvy attorney who knows about this practice and is willing to push, and you have a judge who's willing to let them push, you just might get a better plea offer. You might get the charges dismissed altogether. Um, and we, again, we point to government documents that say this. You could get your case dropped if they don't want to reveal whatever's on the other side of that wall that parallel construction is supposed to create. Um, I have also seen arguments where attorneys themselves say that they can't be effective if they don't know what the underlying investigative method was, that they can't be effective in challenging this and, and mounting the case. And so without weighing in on the merits of that, I've seen people make an, an ineffective assistance of counsel argument there. What could the government be hiding? Potentially anything. And this is where I want to say, we should not just be focusing on the things that were the subject of the Reuters reporting, this idea that there could be NSA programs and big surveillance databases. They could be hiding human source. They could be hiding seriously anything. And so I think it's important not just to think that if you don't believe your case could involve intelligence surveillance and therefore there couldn't have been parallel construction. They could conceal anything. Having said that, um, in our report we document the, the DEA Special Operations Division. The Special Operations Division is a group of agencies, both domestic and foreign, uh, includes Canada and the UK as well, uh, that basically facilitates a tip and lead system. They use intelligence data uh, to send out tips to local law enforcement, and those tips have been scrubbed of mentions of whatever the classified source is. Um, and it facilitates this whole system. So if you ever need to argue that the SOD is, is real or talk about what it is, again, this is all in our report. 
I I'm gonna see if we're doing in time. Okay. So some quotes from my report, you may get pushback from the prosecution saying, you're just speculating, you know, talking about this whole parallel construction thing. Yeah, internet sources have reported it, but this is not real, or we're not gonna admit that it's real. Um, we have quotes from a former SOD, DEA Special Operations Division attorney, saying things like, when law enforcement finds 20 kilos of drugs in a, in a vehicle during a stop, the chances of that being random are unlikely in my opinion. Uh, we quote a federal prosecutor saying, does it bother me a little? Yeah, but if it's, if it's going to stop 100 keys from getting on the street, it's okay by me. I didn't make the rules. I just play by them. This is on the record. It's in our report. Uh, this is not in the report because I found it belatedly, but a DHS task force official testified before Congress last year that when information provided by the intelligence agencies leads to drug interdictions, parallel construction, and I quote, can be conducted before Homeland Security Investigations takes over the case. And he says parallel construction, you can get the video clip. Um, the DOJ Inspector General is currently, has been since 2013, doing an investigation of this, of both the use of subpoenas to create potentially vast call records databases, but they are also looking into, and I quote, parallel construction, the potential use of parallel construction to conceal those large secret data sets. So again, this is if you get pushback on whether this practice is real. Um, Ash is going to go more into intelligence surveillance. All I will say very briefly is that I think people tend to focus in on either call records databases or they focus in on FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, because we know relatively more about it. But there is a huge, huge secret surveillance authority that many people aren't familiar with and it doesn't tend to get talked about, and that's Executive Order 12333. Executive Order 12333 issued in 1981 uh, under the Reagan administration and it basically lets the U.S. intelligence agencies capture any data they want as long as they're doing it outside U.S. borders and they're not deliberately targeting a known U.S. person, meaning a U.S. citizen um, or a, a green card holder. So it's important not to, if you think that there might be a secret kind of data-related tip in your case, please do approach people like us because we may be able to help you craft your motion to be sure that you're getting at all the potential laws or sources that could be underlying that and not fixating on, say, FISA in a way the government could just easily sort of swat away. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ash. Thanks. I'm going to go back a slide just to cover a few of the others. Hi, so my name is Ashley Gorski. I'm a staff attorney in the ACLU's National Security Project, where I focus primarily on challenges to NSA surveillance in both the civil and criminal contexts. Um, today, I'm going to provide a little background on foreign intelligence surveillance authorities because this is an arena in which parallel construction and related practices like withholding notice are endemic. So a very quick primer, uh, in 1978, Congress enacted the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to govern most foreign intelligence surveillance that takes place on U.S. soil. And in 2008, Congress enacted amendments to that act, but what's called traditional FISA is still in play uh, and the government still relies on it when it's targeting a U.S. person on U.S. soil for foreign intelligence surveillance. And obtaining a traditional FISA order bears some similarities to obtaining a wiretap or a search warrant, but FISA surveillance is considerably more permissive and the thresholds for obtaining that order are lower. Uh, to obtain that order, fundamentally, the government needs to show that the target is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power, and it doesn't require any evidence of criminal activity or any showing that there's probable cause to believe that the evidence that's acquired will relate to criminal activity. So it's really a showing about the status of the individual, not the evidence. Uh, as I mentioned in 2008, uh, Congress enacted amendments to FISA, and those are embodied in Section 702. And these substantially altered the FISA regime by authorizing, for the first time, warrantless surveillance on U.S. soil, certain kinds of warrantless surveillance on U.S. soil. Under 702, the FBI, the NSA, and the CIA can intercept Americans' international communications without any indiv individualized court orders, without going to the FISC, um, on an individualized basis, and without even an executive branch finding of probable cause that the target is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. Instead, the statute permits surveillance when two primary criteria are satisfied. First, the analyst reviewing the issue has to believe that the target of the surveillance is a non-U.S. person located abroad. It's a pretty low threshold. And second, that a significant purpose of the surveillance is to acquire foreign intelligence information, which is broadly defined to encompass even information that just bears on the foreign affairs of the United States. Americans who communicate with the government's targets, and there are more than 125,000 targets, 
are swept up in this warrantless surveillance in large numbers. And although the targets are non-US persons abroad, analysts throughout the country routinely search their databases of 702 acquired information using identifiers associated with US persons in a patent end run around the warrant requirement. And these backdoor searches are deeply controversial and uh, there's yet to be a federal court ruling squarely addressing them. Um, turning briefly to the issue of you know, whether it's worth raising these issues in your case at all. FISA surveillance, you know, aspects of this have been upheld as constitutional um, over the years, but your case could still present novel questions, uh, particularly with respect to uh, searches of digital devices. And 702 surveillance has been upheld. Certain kinds of this surveillance have been upheld in district courts and in one circuit court opinion. But the circuit court opinion was very widely condemned as poorly reasoned, um, and there are a lot of reasons to believe that there are still inroads to be made here. So um, 702 is something that could definitely be worth raising in your case. Um, Executive Order 12 triple three. Sarah touched on that briefly. Um, I would just add that. You know, in today's world, Americans' communications are increasingly sent abroad, routed abroad, and stored abroad, where they are subject to bulk surveillance under this authority, and that the authority and associated rules expressly permit the government to engage in bulk surveillance when it's operating abroad. Um, just a few very quick examples of the scope of this collection, which is staggering. The NSA has used 12333 to acquire more than 5 billion cell phone location records per day from around the world. Hundreds of millions of address books and contact lists each year from email accounts and messaging records, messaging accounts, excuse me. It has also used this authority to record every single phone call within, into, and out of at least two countries. And it's used this authority to hack into the data links between Google and Yahoo's data centers abroad. So deeply problematic, ripe for constitutional challenge. Um, I'm going to avoid getting into the weeds on the remaining three authorities on the slide. They pertain to the collection of business records, financial records, communications metadata. Um, I, I would note that there have been indications that the government is still using national security letters, which are like subpoenas with a gag order attached, to acquire cell site location information, which post Carpenter, um, it was questionable before and is even more questionable now. So that's a kind of issue that could be worth raising depending on the facts of your case. So how do you find out if parallel construction was used in your case or if these, um, these particular authorities were used in your case? The government sometimes provides notice of FISA surveillance. Um, the, it's statutorily required to do so when it intends to use information that it obtained or derived from FISA surveillance or searches against a defendant and the defendant was subject to that surveillance. However, there are real questions about how the government has interpreted its notice obligation, and in particular, the term derived. For five years after Section 702 was enacted, the government failed to provide notice to any defendant, and it was only after the Solicitor General had represented to the Supreme Court in a civil case that defendants were receiving notice under the statute, and that's why civil plaintiffs didn't need standing to challenge the statute, that it, the Solicitor General became aware of the fact that DOJ hadn't provided notice to anyone, and that resulted in a reevaluation of DOJ's notice policies. Um, after that, there were um, some notices, retroactive notices. Uh, the notices have mostly dried up, and th that again raises questions about how the government is interpreting the term derived in the scope of its notice obligations. So FISA can be a source of notice, but not reliably. Often, uh, the government does not disclose all the surveillance that it's used in its investigation. That's why we're here and talking about this. So what do you look for? What's useful? Uh, in what circumstances might you want to consider bringing a motion for notice and disclosure of surveillance-related materials? Um, if the indications of surveillance in government filings and discovery suggest that foreign intelligence surveillance may be afoot, or if there are other indications, of surveillance, um, it may be worth bringing a motion. If there are communications with individuals overseas, international travel by your client, or if in general the origins of the investigation are murky. Um, I've seen uh, government filings in which there is some detail about how certain communications were acquired and utter silence as to how other communications were acquired, just the use of the passive voice. When there's that kind of discrepancy, that's something to keep in mind and consider in evaluating 
how to proceed. Uh, and then finally, SEPA filings by the government. Classified Information Procedures Act filings by the government can uh, be an indication of foreign intelligence surveillance, and I'll discuss those more in just a moment. So if you believe that uh, there is undisclosed surveillance in your case, there are options. You can file a motion for notice and disclosure of surveillance related materials. Some of the available grounds include Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 16, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, which guarantee a meaningful opportunity to seek suppression. I'd also note that in the Fifth and Ninth Circuits, um, there's good case law saying that Brady extends to material that could affect the outcome of a suppression hearing. So that would be something to raise as well. Um, 3504 is a statute that requires the government to provide notice if the defendant makes a colorable showing that the evidence has been, uh, was obtained through unlawful surveillance. And finally, FISA's notice provisions also um, require disclosure in limited circumstances. Unfortunately, they have not yet, <laughs> defendants have raised this issue, and because of the way the statute is written and the way the courts have construed it, um, no defendant has received disclosure of a uh, FISA application or order to date. There's one district court that ordered it and um, it was reversed on appeal. So coming back to the Classified Information Procedures Act, in your motion for notice and disclosure, it's worth preemptively addressing SEPA. This is a statute that was enacted in 1980 and it governs um, handling of classified information in criminal proceedings. And the government has used SEPA historically and is doing so today in ways that are designed to allow it to conceal the use of controversial surveillance authorities. Under SEPA Section 4, it has argued uh, to courts on an ex parte basis that various information should not be made available to a defendant because it falls within an exception to the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. Of course, issues like attenuation, like independent, sor independent source, inevitable discovery, these exceptions should be litigated in adversarial context, not in ex parte proceedings. But the government is able to use SEPA Section 4 procedures to argue that this material shouldn't be disclosed to the defendant at all, despite the fact that SEPA is not supposed to put defendants in a worse position than they would otherwise be in a case that didn't involve classified information. So it's worth saying at the outset that the government should not be permitted to use SEPA in this manner. And a couple of examples, um, one is the DOJ Inspector Report, Inspector General Report on Stellar Wind, which was President Bush's warrantless wiretapping program. Um, there's an excerpt that I included in the materials for this panel. And uh, that report goes on at length about how the government used SEPA to mask Bush's use of warrantless wiretapping. Um, just a quick quote, um, the government SEPA submissions argued that information collected by the NSA was too attenuated from the trial evidence to merit a review of the means by which the intelligence information was gathered. And the Inspector General there concluded that DOJ had failed to satisfy its ethical obligations to disclose certain information about stellar wind to defendants. Uh, that report also describes how DOJ tried to hide this information from the FISA court and one DOJ official said, in essence, they couldn't possibly scrub all of the tips from Stellar Wind from FISA applications because those tips were like salt in soup. Once it's there, it just can't be extracted. Um, so I think that that's a helpful way to think about how the government at least is thinking about tips and the obligations associated with merely providing a tip that's derived from controversial surveillance authorities. Uh, the second example is the DEA slides that Sarah mentioned earlier and are also included with the materials for this panel. Um, those describe at length the use of SEPA proceedings to um, mask the use of controversial surveillance authorities. Finally, um, depending on the facts of your case, in addition to filing a motion for notice and disclosure, it may make sense to file a motion to suppress at the same time because that's going to provide um, more of a forum to articulate the constitutional concerns with the surveillance at issue that's potentially at issue um, and to highlight those, those problems for the judge. Um, in our experience, sometimes just bringing the motion for notice and disclosure alone uh, fails to get the court to appreciate um, the, the constitutional significance of the various authorities that may be at issue in a case. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. And I'm going to take 
My name is Brian Poirier. I'm an assistant federal public defender in the District of New Mexico in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time to just talk about a little more simplistic approach to how do you know that your client was subject to parallel construction. And I'm going to uh, piggyback on what Hani said. You start with what I call the Casablanca question. Of all the gin joints in all the world, she had to walk into mine. When you look at some of these stops that we get, and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna say, if you're in Arizona, if you're in New Mexico, you should be very familiar with this concept because unlike California where the highway patrol is busy patrolling the highways, in New Mexico, the state police and in Arizona, the state patrol, they have drug interdiction units in our materials, and I want to talk a little bit more about our materials because there's one I really want everyone to read, and no one, no one ever reads the materials, but if you do nothing else with your materials, read that report, that training material from the DEA from 2007. So we're only 11 years behind the government so far, folks. We've got a lot of catching up to do. But read what they say about the use of these materials and how to shield them. It is frightening. It'll make your blood turn cold. And if you're in Arizona or in New Mexico, or God forbid, you're anywhere where you see the initials HSI, because don't forget, the Department of Homeland Security has an investigation division, and that investigation division has to make cases, and they have to keep their numbers up. And anybody who thinks this is not a bureaucratic numbers game has never waited in line at the MVD. Come on, we know what's going on. But, but when you get a client stopped, on the roadway by a drug interdiction unit for speeding, you probably have a parallel construction case. As simple as that. And when you start picking and picking and picking, you may find yourself um, knocking down the, blowing down the house made of straw. Um, in our materials, we included a complaint that was recently filed in the District of New Mexico a stop made by a Bureau of Indian Affairs Drug Interdiction Officer K-9 unit. He stopped him for speeding, you know? And when you look at the materials, it's like, oh, well, hemisphere and stellar wind and hot list alert from automated license plate. But don't mention any of that. Just say we stopped him for speeding. You know, and, and so these people are, are taking time and resources to make these random stops and one of the best ways to find out, the easiest way to find out, and a way that we did in, in one of the cases in New Mexico, was just ask. You know, Brady, if, 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 nothing, if you take nothing else from this presentation other than my soapbox exhortation at the end, um, remember, Brady, material exculpatory impeachment. It's not material exculpatory because as my con law set, professor said, that's like saying wet water. All exculpatory information is plainly material. You're entitled to material exculpatory or, or impeachment information. The way to get this information is to begin at square one by saying, if you have a traffic stop case or if you have a bus case, the stop was not justified at its inception. I think there's so many of us who just kind of roll right past that and say, well, pff, Cop's going to pull him over for speeding. He's going to say, I tracked him. I locked on with the radar, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but make him prove that. If he stopped your client without a warrant, the burden is on the government to prove the constitutionality. Stop without a warrant, you have the burden of proving an exception applies. You have the burden of proving Terry versus Ohio is applicable. So say he was not speeding. Because this is the thing about parallel construction. There are a lot... Of, of, of problems with it, you know. Um, and, you know, the biggest one is that law enforcement, and if you, again, if you read that, that, that uh, DEA training manual, they, they talk about, oh, if all else fails, what are you gonna do? How, how do you protect this confidential state secret information? And one of the tips they give is structure the indictment around the information. Structure the stop around the information. Structure. That's not tell the truth. That's tell a little truth, hold a little truth back, da 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 And remember, we're not dealing, we're not asking for them to produce under Brady all of the information which they had before the stop 
in order to, ju to determine whether or not the stop was justified at, at its inception. We're asking them to produce all of the information for a federal judge, an Article III judge confirmed by the Senate, presumably has a, se a se top secret clearance, is, can be trusted with these information. You could ask him, judge, produce it in camera. I don't, I don't have to see it. I'm just a lowly public defender, but I want you to know. Because you know when we're talking about any kind of constitutional stop, it often involves the totality of the circumstances. So why shouldn't a judge have the whole truth? And, and because the relevance is obvious. If they stop my client for speeding, but they received a tip saying stop that car for whatever reason you can, then you get to begin with the conversation with the Article III judge. Their assessment was prejudged. Their probable cause assessment was predetermined. And, and maybe he was speeding. Maybe I can't produce sufficient evidence other than my client saying, I was not speeding. Uh, but that's something an Article III judge should have, to know that before they even stopped your client, the assessment of probable cause was predetermined. And that's very troubling for a variety of reasons. But, you know, you can go further. If you are in a place where you have a stop, um, a lot of times you can ask for the officer, you can subpoena the officers, give me all the tickets you wrote that day. If you have a duty log, I want your duty log that day. If you have a, a CAD system, a, a NATIS system, give me all the searches you ran. We did that in New Mexico once. We had a, had a question about, wow, man, of all the gin joints, why you pull my girl over? Just because she's driving in a car with an Arizona plate, you pull her over? And come to find out when we asked for the duty log of the state police, all that guy did all day long was pull people over who had out-of-state plates. He made seven prior stops before he stopped my girl, and they were all out-of-state plates. And this is why this matters, not just to our clients, but to the body politic. And I want to talk a little bit about that at the end. So just dig. Just dig. What were you doing before? What information did you have? Uh, uh, objection, Your Honor, irrelevant. Not irrelevant at all. Under the totality of the circumstance, Your Honor, if he prejudged probable cause before he even laid eyes on my girl, heck no. And then, you know, the other thing that's a blessing in, in, in the middle of nowhere is you don't have FBI agents. You don't have DEA agents. You don't have people who have been skilled for 11 years on how to bury this stuff. The best case we have, and I, I don't think the materials are, are, are in our materials, but if you need them, I'll send them to you, was my client, her name was Claudia Villa Munoz. She's an undocumented immigrant from Arizona who was traveling to Albuquerque with a firearm. Now, as you all know, undocumented immigrants cannot have firearms. So they pulled her over for making an unsafe lane change. And the person who pulled her over was a sheriff's deputy outside the county where he was a sheriff's deputy. Of course, he was a task force officer assigned to the Homeland Security Agency. And when he starts to question her, he's like, ma'am, is there any contraband in the car? She's like, I don't even know what contraband is. He's like, uh, what about any contraband? Anything like, say, uh, uh, I don't know, a gun. You know, they tip their hand. So if they're tipping their hand and you're letting this just roll right by you, because you're too afraid to file a motion to suppress or, or you're, you're afraid that you don't want to. I had one colleague say, I don't want to file that motion to defend. It might offend the court. I said, Get the hell out of here, bro. You know, Claudia needs you to challenge the basis for the stop. Claudia needs you to challenge and say the stop was not, she was not speeding. And if you want to show that she was not speeding, the fact that they stopped seven cars with Arizona plates before Claudia and had a tip then that's a pretty good start on showing that the stop was not justified at its inception. And the thing that we need to do is we need to rely on these traditional tools that we have, even though they may seem antiquated, even though they may seem, you know, not equal measure to the task at hand, the reality is this is our client's life. In Ms. Via Munoz's case, all I did before the hearing, I said, a motion to disclose all the information which the officer had about 
a vehicle before he stopped this vehicle. Anybody think that the judge would say, you can't have that? That's irrelevant? No. And just by asking for it, the next day, case dismissed. Like, yeah. I like those dismissals in federal court. I had a colleague who said, you can't work any miracles in federal court. It's not like state court where you can work miracles. Well, you can if you just push and if you just litigate and if you're just unafraid to be like, come on, judge. Well, talk about the totality of the circumstance. Come on, judge. Because why her? And we have this, oh, a BIA drug interdiction officer, K-9 unit in the Laguna Pueblo of New Mexico making speeding stops. Really? What for? Every stop that that officer has made has been the source of a tip. Now, sometimes a tip is not something so nefarious as, you know, stellar wind or hemisphere or any of these things. The one I think that we have in our materials, I think it was a tip from a rental car company because our super genius was flying back and forth from Florida to San Diego and renting a car and driving and dropping it off. And on the fifth trip, you know, he got stopped. The fifth trip, it's like, way to go, genius. You don't think Avis said, hey, DEA, just so you know, we've, this is the fifth time this guy's rented one way from San Diego to Fort Lauderdale. So just dig, just be creative, and just use these old tools to try to knock down this new surveillance system. And so here's the soapbox portion of my, my lecture. And that is, you know, look where we are. We're in Berkeley, for God's sake. We're in the land of, you know, Students for Democratic Society and Sather Gate and free speech movement. How do you think they would have felt then to know that we would be exposed to a mass surveillance state? And any of you who believe, oh, please, this is not a mass surveillance state. I'm, I'm going I'm to read for you. Um, because this is the final line in that, in that DEA training materials. While not the normal course of business, highly classified intelligence community information is being used to assist law enforcement in their investigative activities. So the federal government, as we explain in our materials, whether they call it hemisphere or stellar wind or these NSA intercept. I mean, I'm reading about the way the NSA routes and, and, and minimizes and I still don't understand it. It's too much for me. How, how do they take all this information and, and move it off to a side and analyze it and summarize it? And I don't know. I read it three or four times. I still don't fully appreciate the technology of it. But I do know that the federal government regularly intercepts and inspects Americans' phone calls, emails, text messages without a warrant. In the material that Ashley refers you to, there's this beautiful discussion among Justice Department personnel about how do we make sure that these guys don't learn about stellar wind. And, and they say, oh, thank God. You know, come to find out the information we're trying to protect that we got from stellar wind, we also had a FISA warrant for. So we'll just say we got it from the FISA warrant. But think about that. The Justice Department is trying to figure out how to protect information that they have that they otherwise could only have gotten by obtaining a FISA warrant. And even the Justice Department didn't know, oh, that's right, we had a FISA warrant. Phew, lucky. Yeah, don't have to dodge that bullet for today. I think there is um, enormous opportunity, not just with the Casablanca question, why my guy, of all the gin joints in all the world, but if we really want to get aggressive, if I'm being charged with a murder and they have an automated uh, license plate reader program in the city of Oakland, then I may do a discovery request, a, a, a sculptory information, see if my client's license plate shows up in front of his house on the day of the murder. They'll be like, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't search all those databases for you. And that brings us to another issue. The government can have all this, they can have all the Facebook they want, they can have all the, everything they want. And we're like, please, sir, might I have some more? No, get the hell out of here. No, because there's a rule of reciprocity, Wardius versus Oregon. If they can have it, then we can have it. If they, if I have to disclose notice of alibi, then the government has to. Justice, you know, it, it's it, reciprocal 
discovery, reciprocity. This is the elements. These are these basic tenets that are just melting away. And this is the soapbox portion, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it open for questions or, or come back to Sarah. But the soapbox, question, soapbox portion is this. We need to have this conversation, not just with the prosecutors, not just with a judge assessing the totality of the circumstances. We need to have this conversation with everyone we know at dinner parties, with our journalist friends, and start letting people know this mass surveillance state, this is very, very real. And when people come back with this, oh, well, I have nothing to hide. <laughs> I'm, I, if I have nothing to hide, no, because this is my privacy. Who's been interdicted? Who's been stopped on the highways and then been subjected to questions about their travel plans? And, and yeah, one, two, were you dealing drugs? Were you dealing drugs? You, come on, admit it, admit it. I, you know, I do this work for a living and I'm on the highway with my nieces coming back from the Grand Canyon and we're pulled over and he calls me out of the car. And he says, sir, step back to the car and put your hands on the roof. I'm like, am I under arrest? He's like thinking I'm all slick. He's like, you might be. You know you're totally powerless. He's asking me about my travel plans. He's asking me, who are you traveling with? And immediately my story becomes inconsistent because I say, my nieces. But you need to know that one of my nieces is transgender. He's actually my nephew. His name is Milo. And you know, my friends are like, oh, transgender cover though. That's a giveaway every time. These are my nieces. I'm trying to have a good day with my nieces. Thank God my 15-year-old niece had some huevos that my brother gave her before she put her out in the world, that she was able to look at that officer and calmly respond to his question. But this is the byproduct of this surveillance state. And I'll tell you the attitude that we need to resist more than any other. You know, this is not just a historic place because of Sather Gate and SDS. This is a historic place because we're in Alameda County. And Alameda County is where the great, incomparable Earl Warren began his public career his career in public service. And he began his career in public service by establishing, when he was DA, the Alameda County Public Defender's Office, and insisting that the public defenders be paid the same as DAs, and insisting that their caseload match the DA. This was 30 years before Gideon. And when you think about why he did that and where we are today, when Earl Warren established the Alameda County Public Defender's Office, he knew people accused of crimes were not evildoers and mobsters and terrorists. He knew they were citizens. And we have devolved to a world where the instruments and, and instrumentalities of war are being used against citizens so that it trickles down all the way to my poor 15-year-old niece whose uncle drives too fast near the Arizona-New Mexico border. So not only do we need to have this conversation with all of the people that we interact about a mass surveillance state, we need to repudiate the idea that we are the enemy, that we, that, that if you read this report from, uh, from uh, the DEA, they talk about, man, our, our intelligence community, guys, they don't have to justify anything. If they want to put a missile up Osama bin Laden's nose, they can. They don't have to go to court to put a missile up his nose. They don't have to reveal their sources of information. Well, guess what? Same thing for the, we don't have to reveal our sources of information. The stop was for speeding. And, and the last point I really want to make technically, this is not Wren. We are not ever going to say this stop was a pretext because until the Supreme Court overrules Wren, that's not the approach. We're not saying this stop was a pretext. We're saying this stop was not justified. They, they're making it up. They've got this information and they make up a reason, an unsafe lane change, speeding. You're going to throw around all this intelligence community stuff and the reason for the stop is speeding. No, it's not. And so to the judges, to the lawyers, to the media, to our friends at dinner, we will resist the mass surveillance state because we are not the enemies of the state. We are the citizens of the state. And privacy is a pretty good thing. I'd like to hold on to it for as long as we can. I'm going to get off my soapbox and hand it back to Sarah.
Thank you, Brian. Believe me, I could talk about the idea that privacy is equality all day. In fact, I think I have in the past. Yeah. Um, so, when you try to find out if parallel construction was used in your case, how is the prosecu prosecution going to respond? Some of you in this room may actually know this even better than I do. Um, I want to say all the motions I'm going to cite, and in fact, many more motions and transcripts are in our report. So once again, please, please refer to that and don't feel like you have to write down case numbers furiously or anything like that. But what arguments are you likely to encounter? Um, and these, in turn, I think are kind of paper-based giveaways that you may actually have a case of parallel construction on your hands. Um, the first is that they'll avoid giving a definitive yes or no. They'll say, oh, you're just speculating. But they won't actually say, no, that didn't happen, or no, we didn't have some other source, or no, you know, no other agency was involved in this investigation. You're just speculating. Or they'll suggest that you, the defendant, should have to provide evidence that something else happened in the background, which of course you can't, because the whole point of parallel construction it's like the point of a concealment method is that you're not supposed to know that a concealment is happening. You don't bury, you don't put something under the floorboards and then put a different color set of boards over the thing that you just buried. Like the point is it's supposed to be seamless. Um, so what you can do is, as Brian is suggesting, try highlighting unusual circumstances that gave rise to suspicion. In a case out of the Eastern District of Virginia um, back in, I think, 2013-ish called Collins, there's a case involving the investigation of hacktivists belonging to the group Anonymous, which I'm sure we've all heard of, that staged a, a distributed denial of service attack on Bank of America and some other institutions. Um, in that case, the attorneys were able to point to some suspicious looking participants in chat rooms who might have been undercover FBI agents acting as, <clears throat> excuse me, agents provocateurs. They also wound up with a slide that Edward Snowden leaked that said GCHQ, the British equivalent of the National Security Agency, was investigating Anonymous. And so they had some specific things they could point to in that case to say, you know, we're not just speculating, we have reasons to think that there may have been undisclosed other agents, other US agency involvement in this case, or foreign agency involved in this case. Um, also, is the government contradicting itself? Is there possible perjury? In a case in, in Brian's jurisdiction called Ramos Perciaga, uh, the defense has thus far been able to suggest that maybe the DEA agent was, was giving conflicting testimony, um, or that the government was making a series of contradictory assertions in its motions, suggesting that perhaps there was something going on in the background that they didn't want to discuss. So you can try pointing to those things. Um, so, I, I love this motion, or rather I love this transcript. In Collins, the case of the Eastern District of Virginia, you know, the prosecution, prosecution is saying, well, we have no reason to think that there was any other agency involvement, and you know, if you make us look at it in this case, I want to do it in every case. And the judge said, Fine. why is it so hard for the government to go ask the NSA? Why is it so hard for the government to go ask the FBI? You're acting like this is climbing Mount Everest, is what he says, it's not. The DOJ, um, there are liaisons from what we understand that each of these law enforcement or intelligence agencies whose job it is to liaise with the DOJ, including about prosecutions that arise out of intelligence tips. It's not that hard to pick up the phone and check, um, is what the judge says and what the, what the defense attorney said, and I think we agree. Um, and actually, in Ramos Versiaga, again, this is an ongoing case. Don't take any of this as gospel, but in an in order, the court directed the AUSA to, um, to search the case files at the DEA or other agencies and to ask about the existence of the discovery the defense was seeking. In other words, again, go ask, go look at the case file. It's not that hard, why can't you do that? Um, so you can, that's a, a very recent decision from I think October of this year that you can take a look at. Um, sometimes, uh, as again I think Brian alluded to, the prosecution will come back and say, well, there's, we don't have anything else that's discoverable. We don't have anything else that would be admissible. They're not saying they don't have anything else. They're saying that they've made a determination that nothing else is discoverable or admissible. It doesn't mean they don't have anything else. Um, and so there's a, a good uh, defense response, uh, a motion in a case called Daoud, which actually was a suspected Section 702 of FISA case, um, where the defense attorneys said, well, why do the prosecutors get to be the gatekeepers in deciding what's admissible or not? That's not their role, that's the judge's role. If you think you have something and you're arguing that it's not admissible, it's not for you to say that. Let the court decide that through an adversarial process. Um, and actually in Daoud, they made some initial progress in, in getting an order for disclosure of surveillance and then that got overturned, uh, but that document is worth looking at. They'll also say for Brady purposes, well, we don't have to go check because the intelligence agencies aren't part of the prosecution team. Mm. 
And they say, we have no reason to believe evidence came from the NSA. Again, that's not saying no, it's a kind of non-denial. We have no reason to believe. But again, you can think about the Collins case. It's not that hard to go check. And frankly, I, I find this, the, the idea that the government is not the government, the oh, idea that the you. intelligence agencies are not part of the prosecution team is ripe for being eviscerated by a thoughtful judge somewhere. <laughs> So I think Brian has really laid out many of the kind of the, the bigger sort of moral points we made about this. Um, but I think it, I, I want to also make the point, which maybe you could also use, is that if this is allowed, if the government is targeting people because of their lawful First Amendment protected activity, or if the government is singling people out because of their race or their religious beliefs, or singling them out on, on the basis of them belonging to a group, again, think about this example I gave, be on the lookout order for Mennonites with farm equipment crossing the border from Mexico. Um, you, you really, you have the building blocks of a police state. You have the government doing potentially unlawful or things that are really odious to human rights, odious to the Constitution, and never having to reveal that to the courts, to the public, to defense attorneys, to Congress. And then there is no way to rein it in. That system of checks and balances no longer works. Um, I think that is the end of the presentation. I think we have some, we may have, I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. I also want to say, I would love to release updates to our parallel construction report. If you have suspected cases, please do bring them to me. Um, I would love to be able to share any motions I have with you that could be useful. And likewise, if you have anything you've gotten that's useful, I would love to see that. And, and one thing I wanted to also mention is, you know, we are a little bit slow in responding to this brave new world, what God hath wrought. And I always tell people, students that I teach, I like to encourage people. I used to say, read Justice Douglas's dissent in uh, Terry versus Ohio. If you haven't read it, if you haven't read it recently, I encourage you to read it because it gives you a perspective. He's saying, of course, we want to stop crime, but there are these hydraulic pressures that come to bear. And when you allow police officers to have a certain latitude, it just grows and grows and grows. Read that and then read Justice Sotomayor's dissent in Utah versus Street because that's as beautiful legal writing as it gets when she talks about we are in a carcerate state. We live for the, with, the, with the grace and the permission of the state. The world has changed fundamentally since Terry versus Ohio. We need to change as well. And this idea that we, we're talking about it uh, in terms of you know, uh, proactive measures to just get information about why our client was stopped. But this could expand. The government has all these resources. The government has all this information. The very least they could do is be called upon to search it for the benefit of our client as well. Who has, works in a jurisdiction with automatic license plate readers? Who doesn't even know whether or not their jurisdiction has automatic license plate? I mean, because what they found with, auto, you're talking about religious discrimination, the automatic license plate readers being used to, um, to get all the license plates of everybody stopped at the mosque. You know, and, and well, now we all know Muslims are just the biggest terrorist and every, every Muslim is just a terrorist in the making. But I mean, that kind of police intrusion has got to be resisted. And if we can't do it proactively on behalf of our client, maybe we could do it defensively by just saying, search your database for this license plate number on this day and tell me where it was. Now, mind you, you know, practice pointer, you may ask for something from the government and they may give you something and be like, yeah, that license plate was at the murder scene. You're like, ah! You know, so use your good judgment. But, but the reality is they have so much more information that they will let us have access to and the days of just being like, okay, should stop today. Um, and before we open it up for questions, I just wanted to say that we... Um, <laughs> would invite you if you at all suspect that foreign intelligence surveillance was used in your case uh, to email the National Security Project, to email me, my contact information is in the packet of materials. Um, we routinely draft and consult on motions for notice and disclosure and would be more than happy to talk through issues with you or review briefing. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it goes to the question of like the, the, the Avis tip, you know? I mean, there's nothing wrong with Avis calling the DEA and giving them a tip. But it doesn't have to be illegal to result in the police prejudging the stop before they even make the stop. And again, I personally hate that phrase, the totality of the circumstances, because that's one of those phrases that's only used against the defense. But if we gotta you know, live by the totality of the circumstances, let's make the government die by it too. 
And, and there's no way you could have a totality of the circumstance case where you're not entitled to all of the, and it's a very simple question, all of the information that the law enforcement agency had about this individual or this vehicle or this event before they encountered the defendant. Yeah, I, so actually just yesterday I pulled together a, a kind of very informal set of notes for someone in FPD's office, um, kind of summarizing things I found where judges have expressed a kind of frowning sentiment about parallel construction in general, um, even if they didn't rule against it, even if they didn't grant the suppression motion, um, or things that were parallel construction-like, and I'm happy to share those. Um, one thing to be aware of is that in Ramos Perciaga, this new, new district of New Mexico, where they might still be fought, um, the court did reject a Robiero argument, I believe, where the government was basically saying, well, we wouldn't have to disclose necessarily the identity of human witness, so we don't have to disclose this law enforcement sensitive technique either, and the court's response, as I recall, was basically no. Um, I, don't remember, I don't remember the details of the reasoning, but the court declined to extend Roviero that far. Um, again, part of the problem is one of the problems with parallel construction is that you're not supposed to know what happened, and prosecutors often don't, want, don't even want to acknowledge that it exists. And so we don't have a whole lot of great explicit case law frowning on the practice in general, but of course we have cases frowning on fruit of the poisonous tree and frowning on perjury. Um, so those are other ways of kind of, of getting at that. Um, but if, if this comes up for you and you want some potentially helpful sources, please let me know and I'll forward those notes that I just pulled together. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, we could brainstorm all day the, the, the circumstances under which we could arise. This. And, and I would say this idea like, oh, they're just speculating. Well, attach the DEA training manual that's in our materials as Exhibit A and say, I'm speculating, but boy, oh boy, it sure does seem like they do this, they acknowledge they do this, so the question is, did they do this? And, and, and never underestimate the vanity of a judge, ladies and gentlemen. You know, just be, it's all, judge, they don't want you to know? They don't trust you with the information? Come on, judge. Then we're really, they must be, that must be something they really don't want anybody to see if they don't want your honor to see it. Oh, can I add, actually, something I meant to follow up about, um one of Ash's points, I know we were like two minutes away from lunch, so this is, I think, significant. Speaking of things that um, law enforcement might not want the judge, at least the judge in your jurisdiction, to see, there's a quote in our report on the record, again, from that former DEA Special Operations Division attorney saying, SEPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act, is a very powerful, very misunderstood statute. And that's all that person would say. Um, but I think that it is potentially worth thinking about things that could have been done in your case by the government to shield information from disclosure even to, to your judge where they think you know, there's some underlying mechanism that maybe lets them not disclose that. So I will leave you with that, that vague and ominous SEPA note. We don't want to cut into lunch, but we could probably take one more question if anyone has yeah. it. Thank you for being such a great audience. There you I go. look forward to hearing from you.